We've been doing this expository sermon message for a couple of weeks. And in chapters 1 through 14 of the first chapter of Ephesians, talks about spiritual blessings God has given to us in heavenly places. Amen? And so, today we want to talk about verse number 9 and 10. Having made known unto the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Looking back, verse 9, it says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. What's he talking about? The mystery. Anytime I see that word in the Bible, I want to know exactly what it's talking about. And it's not used too often, but every once in a while you'd be reading along and it talks about there's a mystery that's been hid. And uh, there's more than one mystery. So looking at this particular scripture, it says that God has revealed unto us the mystery of his will. Of course, what we want in our lives, and everybody can agree with this, we want God's perfect will to be done in our lives. Amen? Amen. And so, God had this mystery of his will. It was actually his eternal plan. And to understand this, you have to look at the volume of the book. You got to look not just at one verse, one book, but what is God saying? And you start with the book of Genesis, and you look all the way to the concluding book, the book of Revelation. And over time, God has moved forward and dealt in the lives of people and even continue to do that today and revealing the mystery of his will. And so, looking at God's eternal plan, God had a plan. I mean, he's a strategic planner. Nothing catches him by surprise because he's God. He's sovereign. And and we need to follow the example of the Lord. We need to make plans. I mean, you don't get up in the morning and say to your family or say to each other, let's go on a vacation. And you jump in a car and take off. (laughs) And uh, you need to make sure uh, your car is running well. You need to make sure you got enough money in your pocket or you have a a credit card that's paid up, all right, that you know where you're going. And uh, even though a lot of people, not only in taking a vacation, just in going through life, and that uh, I remember when I was in a service, before I got out of the military, I had a plan. And one plan was, I'm not going to (laughs) re-enlist. And I told my Sarge, please, Don't ask me that because I'm going to tell you what the answer is right now. It was a good four years for me. Uh, I learned a great deal, but I had a plan. I had a motion. I actually started initiating that plan the second year I was in the military. I wanted to go to college after I got out of the military, so I started in 1966 and went to night school on my off-duty time for two years at a local college. And then I, when I got discharged from the military, I knew where I was going to go to school. I had an idea what I wanted to study. So, I mean, I had a plan. And I still do that. I I plan ahead. You need to at least have a five-year plan of what you want to do. If you don't have a plan, you probably just are bumping around. You know, what's going on? And when you look at God, he said, I had an eternal plan and that it's being unfolded. So looking at this scripture, it says here, at the end of history, the climax of the ages, God says, 
I will bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven and things in the earth. That's found in the 10th verse of chapter 1. He's going to bring everything together in heaven and on earth together in Christ. Christ is the catalyst that makes everything work. Colossians talks about that, that principle where God even takes the basic fundamental, I mean, fundamental principle of protons and neutrons, opposite forces, yet keeps it together. The theory of consistency, you can see that in the book of Colossians. That Christ is the one who keeps everything together. Our solar system. How the earth revolves around the sun. And how we get our calendar, the day and night, and all these things. I mean, God has it right down to an exact science, you might say. And so, he's in the process of moving through time as we see. But God stands outside of time and space. He's not limited. We have a clock. Today, we... According to our calendar, uh, is Sunday, the first day of the week, and then tomorrow we recognize Memorial Day, and then we'll have the 4th of July, and we, and we go through. We have certain landmarks set as a people, and we follow things. And so, to get a better understanding of what that means, Randy Elkhorn wrote a book about 400 pages on heaven. If you haven't read that book, you need to get it. It really challenges you, give you an idea of a good understanding of what heaven's all about. He says this, After creating the heavens and the earth, God called them very good. Never once has he renounced his claim on what he made. He isn't going to abandon his creation. He's going to restore it. Amen? We won't go to heaven and leave earth behind. Rather, God will bring heaven and earth together in the same dimension with no walls of separation, no armed angels to guard heaven's perfection from sinful mankind. Remember when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, expelled from the garden? It says he put some guards at the entrance to Eden at that time. So they couldn't get back to eat the tree of life. But God, and what he's planned, will remove that. There won't be any separation. So God's perfect plan is to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, when you begin to think about that, to get a better idea of God's eternal plan, there's a key word that jumps out here in the scriptures that I read. And that word is redemption. The word redemption means to buy back that which was formerly owned. You think maybe when in the Garden of Eden when Satan came and tempted Eve and then she ate of the forbidden fruit and then Adam did likewise and you see, oh my goodness, these people had this free will and instead of trusting and obeying God, they violated the covenant that they have with the Lord, and then they found themselves in a predicament. They realized that they were naked, that they were in a sinful condition, and they were expelled. Amazing. God initially created Adam and Eve to live forever. Adam lived to be 930 years old. Wow. That's a long time. And so you see that God had a plan to restore back that which was taken away. And so God's at the end of time looking to, and seeing how his plan is being fulfilled. I saw this well illustrated, God's eternal plan illustrated back in March when Diana and I went up to Kentucky to see the ark encounter. How many have been up there and seen the ark? Okay. Also, went to the Creation Museum. How many saw that? There's a guy there. He's the CEO of the Ark Encounter and also the Creation Museum. His name is Ken Ham. And when you go through the Creation Museum, he outlines God's eternal plan. 
He starts with the book of Genesis and goes all the way through and concludes in the book of Revelation. He calls it the seven seas. Now, you might want to write this down or put it in your memory bank. And there's, I'm not going to give you the scripture for each one, but I'm just going to mention it. First C is creation. And we talked about that already. God created the heavens, the earth, and when he got finished, he said, this is very good. It was a perfect environment. There's no sin, no death, no pain, no suffering, no war going on in the Middle East, nothing happened in Eastern Europe. You saw a perfect environment. My heart was really touched this past week when I looked at the news on my iPhone and I saw there was a young couple who were missionaries in Haiti, Davy and Natalie Lloyd. And they were working just north of Port-au-Prince and they were working in an orphanage The orphanage was started by Davy's parents back in 2000. As a young boy, he said, one day I'm going to go to Haiti and be a missionary and help those people. You know what's going on in Haiti right now. Gang violence. 80% of the capital city of Port-au-Prince is controlled by gangs where they're just ravaging the whole culture. And life, the sanctity of life isn't in existence there. And this couple was leaving church and they were attacked. Young couple, been married, they were married in 2022. And another young Haitian young man with them and this gang tortured them and killed them. You see, this world we live in is broken. This world is inundated with sin and death. The only way out of this dilemma in this world is Jesus. The world is looking for peace. They're trying to negotiate peace in the Middle East right now between Hamas and Israel. Been trying to do this. They hopefully one day you can get a resolution or an agreement between Russia and Ukraine. Now, here's the truth. We'll never have peace in this world until we recognize and embrace the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. The problem in the world is not because there's not enough money. It's not because we don't have enough educational institutions to train people how to be civilized. It's not that we don't have a police force or military. The problem exists right here in the heart of man. The heart of man is evil and deceitful above all things. The only way that that can be changed is by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, what a person believes, their belief system affects how they think and behave. And out of that comes their action, their behavior. Belief, the mind, the behavior. And so the way to deal with the evil in this world and God and his eternal plan, you'll see how he provides that, is for a person to be changed and transformed. Like today when we baptized Victoria, She said, I'm identifying with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I have become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But you see, initially when this whole started, when God had creation, he looked at it. He created the heavens and the earth, everything as we see it and experience it all the animals and the plants and trees and everything, and then the zenith of his creation. The prized thing was the creation of mankind. He created man in the likeness image of himself. 
In that image, he means not an intellectual situation or a physical situation. We're created in the likeness, image of the Lord to be his representatives in the earth. For us to really do that, we got to be born of God and exemplify and represent the Lord Jesus Christ. The first seed was creation. And then what happened, as we've said so many times, corruption came into the Garden of Eden. And what happened? Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And so you see the second sea corruption. And then after that, as you begin to move through the book of Genesis, you see God's judgment, a catastrophe takes place where he looked upon his creation and what was happening because of corruption in the world, evilness just went to exponentially, evidently, to the place where God says, I repent that I created man. Now, God does not repent. What that means in the Hebrew, he sighed. He was extremely disappointed with the fact of what happened in the earth. And so God is a just God, so he punishes the evilness that was so predominant in the culture, and the flood takes place. Interesting. How many people, I don't know how many people were alive then, but it says there were only eight people who survived that catastrophe. Noah and his family. And God provided an ark. Our ark today is not a boat made out of wood. Our ark today is Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. A place of safety. No matter what happens. Talking about that young couple that was brutally murdered and their life taken, this young couple, the father of the young lady and also the father of the young man said, we know where they are today. They're in the presence of God. They're in heaven. So we can rejoice in that. Psalms 35 says, mourning and grieving endures for a night. But joy comes in the morning. If you're a believer in Christ Jesus, when you see the passing of a loved one who is a follower, a believer, been born of God, then you mourn, which is human nature, because we love that person. But at the same time, we can have the joy of the Lord and rejoice in Jesus' name because we know that in Christ Jesus, we have a gift called eternal life. Amen? So, Creation, corruption, catastrophe. Then you see what happened. Man begins to actually worship himself. He says, we need to build a tower unto ourselves and complete defiance towards God Almighty. And so what God does, there is one language on the planet at that time. I mean, you get one language, you have no communication barrier. And they were smart. They didn't text or email. They communicated. They talked to each other. I was going to send my, one of my daughters a message the other day, and I started to respond to her text, and I'm going like, I said, wait a minute. I did something quicker. I punched and called her and talked to her on the phone. I said, oh my. you can't communicate that well with a text message. Now, you might communicate with text message, I'll meet you at 5 o'clock at Longhorns for supper. I get that figured out. But if it starts going to about three or four pages, I'm trying to figure out, what did you say? So anyways, what God did at the Tower of Babel, because he saw what was happening, and mankind was... Fleeing away from God, he confused the languages. So confusion took place. And then you see God moving through his redemptive plan. You see Christ comes. God comes to earth in human form. The Lord Jesus Christ. He came here to identify with us. Tempted as we are, 
yet without sin to become a perfect sacrifice to appease the wrath of God. And then the sixth seed, the cross. On the cross, he took all the sin of the world, all that burden upon him. Many people have died on the cross, but the difference between Jesus and all others who have suffered that way, the Father turned his back upon Jesus because he wouldn't look upon that sin that was on his favored son. And then the last C, consummation, we see that, of course, Christ came out of the grave and at the final conclusion, at the consummation of the age, we see Christ returning, his second coming. It said the dead in Christ shall rise first, so, and those who are alive remain shall be caught up with the Lord. So every single one of us who are believers, follower of Jesus Christ, if you were born in the first century or the last century, you will be there at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Amen? And then what he says, at the consummation of the age, bring everything in heaven and earth together in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in Revelation chapter 21, I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth. I think God will keep that which is good, amen, but all that that's corrupted and all that that's ungodly will be removed. At the consummation of the age, it talks about the separation of the tares from the wheat, the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the unrighteous. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you will not suffer the wrath of God. The wrath of God comes up on those who have rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior down through the ages. The devil, the antichrist, the beast, all that is cast into the lake of fire, the second death. As believers in Christ Jesus, we don't suffer the wrath of God. Hallelujah. Now, in this life, we have trials and tribulations. Everyone can attest to that. And as I mentioned, this wickedness is so prevalent in our world today. It seems more so than ever before, but it's nothing new under the sun. What happened to this young missionary couple in Haiti? My dear friend, two and a half years ago, also serving in Haiti, was executed because he was a man who was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, taking a stand for the right thing. You might say, would, well, I would never go there because it's a dangerous place. The safest place for you to be at any time that God calls you is smack dab in the middle of his will. Amen? Some of you might be called to be a missionary in Afghanistan. So, oh, no, no, not me. Is Jesus worth it? If he called you, say he, you have a vision in the night, you have a dream, and you know it's from God, he calls you to do something. And we can always excuse ourselves out of it. Remember that parable about the Good Samaritan? Where the wealthy man, the Levite, made excuses. No, nah, we can't do this. He's unclean. We don't want to touch that guy. He's a problem. The good Samaritan went the extra mile. So you can see that God had a plan from the beginning of creation. And you see how Ken Ham has outlined the eternal plan of God with the seven seas. I thought that was brilliant. I like that. Maybe we need to dig into that a little bit more. But you can see that God, the mystery of his will, his eternal plan being unfolded down through the ages. A blessing, a spiritual blessing. That means, you know what that means to me personally and you personally? That God has us. Amen? That God has us right in the palm of his hand. When you look at the new heaven and new earth, just a few things. When you begin to read chapter 21 and 22, I love the book of Revelation. It's not something to be scared. There's a lot of apocalyptic language, symbolic language. You can't take numbers literally. 
If you do, you're going to run into a traffic jam in your mind. Even when people try to define the millennium. And they talk about how some people take their eschatology and they say, well, what's going to happen is there's going to be this big battle on earth. And you're going to see after three and a half years, you're going to see the Antichrist emerge and he's going to be the supernatural guy and he's going to be wounded in the head. He's going to have this miraculous transformation. He's going to gather a million man army and come against all the saints right there in Jerusalem, which is 125 miles long and 50 miles wide. You couldn't hit it with a nuclear bomb because it's so close you overshoot it probably. And you get all these scenarios and everything. Listen, the Bible is so clear about the second coming of Jesus. Just at his appearance, all that which is not of God disintegrates. Satan is not a contest for God. He's already defeated. And if if you don't think so, then he's deceived you. He gives the believer authority over principalities and powers. Amen. You need to pray with that authority. Hallelujah. So look, just about the new heaven, new earth, just a few things. When you read through the scripture, the tabernacle of God will be with men dwelling and abiding with God in intimate fellowship. What that's saying there is that there's no sea in the new heaven, the new earth. We have oceans that separate us from other continents. And we think, well, that's a buffer zone so our enemies can't get to us. It talks about a glass sea in heaven. Well, that's removed because it's saying symbolically there's no separation between us and Almighty God. What we'll have in the new heaven and new earth is intimate fellowship with God. Amazing. You see... As you read through the Bible, here, mankind on earth, it says that no person has ever seen and looked into the face of God. It'd be like looking into the sun. It'd be like, remember the solar eclipse? Put those glasses on so you won't go blind. That's just the sun, but looking into the face of God Almighty. You have to have a glorified body to stand in his presence, and God's prepared that for us. So what he's saying here is one of the first things, the tabernacle of God is with men dwelling and abiding with God, meaning we have that intimate fellowship. Another thing, he says, the Lord will make all things new. Hallelujah. That's hard for us to comprehend even in this life. Think about it. He says, within the context of that scripture, no more pain, suffering, injustice, death will all pass away And we will freely drink from the water of life, Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, a lot of people have trouble understanding a lot of this symbolic apocalyptic language. And I I think one reason for that is because we try to understand God just from our natural senses. And what he's talking here about spiritual things. As it is on earth, so shall it be in heaven. I think what's happening here, there's a direct correspondence of things happening in the heavenlies. And so we have a difficult time making that adjustment going from here to there. And we have to have the Lord to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Many times when you read in the book of Revelation, it says, do you have eyes to see and ears? ears to hear. He's talking about a spiritual ability to perceive and see things in the spiritual realm. When you were born of God, when you came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, did you have a piece of paper that had a contract and you can see it written in the blood of the Lamb? No. How can you prove to someone that you're born of God? How do you do that? How do you know that you're born of God? It's a spiritual encounter. One thing that I learned a long time ago, the inner witness of the Spirit of God that tells me 
that I know, I know beyond a shadow of doubt when I take my last breath and close my eyes for the last time that I'll wake up in the presence of God. Well, how do you know that? How can you be sure? Romans 8, 16 says this, God's spirit bears witness my spirit that I am one with him. Another thing, good Christian apologetics, what was written on this book thousands of years ago has become a living reality in my life and your life. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, who was a Harvard graduate in Judaism, he said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, for you to enter into the kingdom of God, that's where God rules and reigns, his spiritual kingdom, which has no beginning and no end. He says, you must be born again. Nicodemus, a brilliant man, immediately tries to interpret that understanding, those words of Jesus, in a natural way. How can I enter back into my mother's womb? Jesus says, no, no, that's not it. He says, you got to be born of the water and the spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean? You mean the water that had to be baptized to get into heaven? No, that's, he's not, what he's not talking about water baptism. That is identifying, it's an act of faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ, which is important and significant. So you go to the book of Ephesians, the third chapter, I think it's the 20th verse or 21st verse. It says, the washing of the water for the renewing and regenerating of the mind. The word of God, when you hear God speaking to you, when it touches you, it becomes gold to you. When you see that, that word of God will strengthen you, cleanse you, and work in your heart and mind to give you better understanding of what it means to be close to God and know Him. The washing of the water of the Word. And then the working and moving of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God, Jesus said to Nicodemus, it's like the wind. It's like the wind. You can see the effects of it. For example, I looked out here in the corn out here after we had that storm just recently. And the wind blew. I went out there. I could see the effects of the wind on the corn. Some of the corn is laying over like this. And Wayne promised me he would go out there later and straighten all the corn that was leaning like this. So he's going to be a vessel, instrument of God to straighten the corn. You see the effect of the corn, I mean of the wind on the corn. But which way did it come from? Did it come from the north, the south, the east, or west? So it is like the Spirit of God when he deals with a person. Every person is different. God knows what button to push in your heart. He knows. He knows how to get your attention. How he works with you might be different than how he works with me. With me, God has used a steel bar to hit me in the head. And then I came to my senses, and I heard the voice of God, and I was set free. This happened a long time ago. Other people, their head is not that hard, and he gently deals with them. And it says in John chapter 6, the Spirit of God, how he'll come, and what he will do, he will draw you, or in the, he, in the Greek it says compel you, to cause you to want to desire God. That has to happen for you to be born again. Salvation is not of itself. It's not of man. Salvation is of God where he comes and he begins to deal with you. And then you come to the place where you exercise your faith. You say, God, I don't understand all this, but I know you're dealing with me. I believe I trust you. And you give your life. You die to live. And he changes you. But you have to believe. Paul said, repent, confess, believe, and you belong to me. Will you make mistakes thereafter? You bet. We all do. 
And when I make a mistake, I know God. He takes him out behind the church, ties me to a tree, and I repent. <laughs> Amen. How many can say God has dealt with me? He's, I've, I've had a whooping before. I mean, if you're a good parent, you have disciplined your children, right? Amen. There are, my sister Sheila's here. I have a, another sister, another brother. I'm the oldest, and I ended up being the preacher. But guess who got the most whippings? Sheila. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. I may, maybe Sheila got one or two, but I had one a week. Because I had that, uh, that rebellious spirit in me, and God broke that. Hallelujah. Amen. God listens to a a broken and a contrite heart. Amen? So, he makes all things new. And I tell you what, he's making us new in him. Here's another thing. It talks about, in these last two chapters of Revelation, the new Jerusalem is the church, the bride of Christ, which will be adorned, a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. She will be holy without blemish, and you are part of that organization, the Church of Jesus Christ. I believe the church is God's vehicle to usher in his kingdom. His kingdom is where he rules and reigns. You see, you can see the, the presence, the reality of God's kingdom when he uses you to walk into a situation where there may be chaos, confusion. I've seen it. I, I've actually had that happen where Someone was in need, crying, weeping, broken, and you come and begin to pray for them. You see the Spirit of God begin to calm them and speak to them. The kingdom of God is present. We're praying for people, for them to be healed. They get touched by God and healed. The kingdom of God is a living, present reality. I can remember down in Haiti when those witch doctors tried to put a curse on us. We just lifted our hands and worshiped Jesus, and people came to the Lord. The kingdom of God was a living reality. Amen? You see people's lives changed and transformed. The kingdom of God is present. Amen? Finally, it mentions here in Revelation chapter 22, it says, at the consummation of the age, the last sea, there will be a distinct separation of the righteous from the unrighteous. Overcomers shall inherit all things will be known as the sons of God Others, unbelieving, fearful, murderers, and the list goes on, will be cast into the lake of fire. My prayer is all those that God has chosen, his elect, God will deal with them. God will bring those unto him. All that the Father has given to the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. The word elect means to be chosen. I mean, just comprehending that and, and embracing that concept. Before God even started this whole eternal plan, part of his plan was he knew us before he created the foundations of the earth. Wow. You know what that means? If God does something, he doesn't make a mistake. When God elects you, and you're born of God, he gives you the strength to persevere, and he will not let you go. You might rebel, you might goof up, you might make a mistake, but you know what? This thing called a loving God who keeps you in the palm of his hand, he'll pull you back unto him. I've known a lot of good men and women who were born of God and made mistakes, dropped the ball, done some ungodly things. And you know what? God never gives up on them. You, he gives you the strength to persevere, to be born of God. Next Sunday, I'll spend two weeks on, can I know for sure that I'm born of God. 
can I know for sure that I'll not fall away? Because the Word of God gives us that insurance. He want, see, you need that insurance. You know why? So you can grow. What kind of life would it be you get up in the morning, one day you think I'm going to heaven, the next day you get up, you're going to hell, up and down, up and down, up and down. I don't want a relationship like that. It'd be like you being married to your spouse. And one day, Wayne says, I think Brenda's going to stay with me. And the next day, I think Brenda's leaving. And then they, oh, I think she's going to up and, I mean, you know, Brenda's going to say, get out of here, Wayne. <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was picking on them because I know they're a solid couple. Amen. <laughs> I mean, God doesn't do that to us. And he reassures us every day. And some days we think, man, I, you know, I really messed up. I, I, I don't think God's going to forgive me of this. And the thing is, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us from some of our sins. All of our sins. Hallelujah. Please stand. <laughs>